Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So in this second video, uh, we're going to talk about uh, the treatment of hyponatremia. First, we're going to give a quick summary, uh, and then we'll talk about the treatment, and then we'll give an example uh, of uh, a case to kind of uh, to try to uh, uh, make it a little bit more uh, clear, hopefully. So let's go. Now, what about treatment of hyponatremia? Uh, so. Uh, the first thing is, of course, to treat the underlying cause. So you figure out what's causing it and try to see if we can treat it, whether it be iatrogenic or the uh, DI, diabetes insipidus, uh, or you know, GI losses. So treat the underlying cause, and then if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, just like we talked about in the clinical features, uh, you have to uh, support the hemodynamic by giving uh, normal ceiling. You have to maintain the blood pressure, maintain the circulation, maintain the um, uh, heart rate to uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, have a normal tissue perfusion or close to normal tissue perfusion. That's a priority. Volume is a priority. And then, uh, then the Definite, definite treatment of dehydration is uh, to remove the D, right? Dehydration, no water. So take out the D and put the water back. So basically you just do water replacement and you do it slowly over uh, at least uh, two days. The fluid that we usually use is uh, uh, D5W. Um, so the, the amount uh, you, you uh, need to uh, ca to give is basically can be calculated by one of uh, two uh, equations. So the, it's just basically the water deficit, right? So this is a volume of how many liters you need to give over, you know, two days at least. So that depends on the uh, current uh, sodium level. The patient is, for example, 150, you want to get it to 140, so 150 minus four, 140 divided by 40, and then you multiply that by the total body water. It's, you know, uh, normally a 60%, but you know, usually in someone who's obese or maybe in ladies, it can be a little bit less than that. So you can use 50% or even 40% in very obese patients. Uh, so it's really depending on the muscle mass of the patient. Another simpler equation, um, for example, again, if the patient is 150, so uh, you you want the desired change would be around 10. You want it from to go from 150 to 140. So it's 10. 10 multiplied by body weight. If the patient is 100 kilos, then it's a liter, one thousand, and then you mu multiply that by four. So it's going to be like four liters um, need to be given of water over 48 hours. You know, so you can use any equation. Again, this is just an estimation. It's not um, uh, absolute. But one important note I want to mention is that you have to add any ongoing losses. So um, this four liters, for example, we just calculated, you might actually need to give a little bit more, like five liters or, f or five and a half, uh, depending if you think there is other losses that uh, you know, might be still going on at the time of repletion, right? Because you, you know, you, you get, you, you're going to give this fluid over two days. So over these two days, there most likely will be some other ongoing losses. So you have to count for that. So this is, I think, is probably the most common cause of why hypernatremia is undercorrected. A lot of time it is taking us a little bit more than uh, necessarily to correct it. I think this is because we tend to underestimate the amount of water loss. So remember, add any ongoing losses. And then you can give this amount by oral. Uh, the patient can take orally or NG tube or uh, PEC tube, whatever uh, oral route is available. Uh, or IV, or you can use both if you're giving like uh, a lot of volume, like four liters. So you can, uh, the patient might uh, need two liters over a day, so that he will get four liters over 48 hours. These two liters over a day, you can give half of it um, orally and half of it uh, through IV with the D5W. So it's really, uh, you know, they have a lot of options. Uh, if the patient has intact gut, you can use that, but if not, then you have to give it IV. So there is a lot of flexibility there. And then uh, if you're using anything apart from D5W, uh, for example, D5W plus half normal saline, this is a little bit more concentrated. So in that case, you might need to double the rate uh, to get to correct the sodium within the same amount of time, which is 48 hours usually. So because it's just more concentrated, so it's not as dilute as the D5W, so you might increase or double the rate to correct it in the appropriate time. And then, you know, the most important, just like in hyponatremia, you have to check the serum sodium 
uh, serially every four hours every six hours every two hours depending on the severity and acuity and, uh, and uh, how sick the patient and uh, how un unstable the patient is and it's kind of the same amount of correction in hyponatremia so uh, not more than uh, uh, eight to ten millimoles uh, in a day although i have to say the overcorrection uh, and risk of the um, complications is really less and well uh, not well uh, studied and known as compared to hyponatremia but again because it's a serious condition then you uh, you still have to think about it and that's why it's very important that you check the serum sodium regularly that's the only way you can tell whether your correction is appropriate or not but you know in my experience under correction is probably more common um, you know instead of correcting over 48 hours which should be the goal you know, unfortunately, we tend to kind of correct it over, th um, you know, three days, four days. The patient remained hypernatremic for more than necessarily. So keep that in mind. Uh, and then if the patient is having hyperglycemia, that could be the cause of the hypo hypernatremia, then you have to correct for that as well. And there is an equation for that. And also, um, if uh, in, uh, uh, the treatment for a patient who had hypernatremia due to excess salt, like, for example, if the patient had a lot of salt in the TPN, um, or uh, excessive hypertonic saline, for example, then you might need to give them diuretics to get rid of that sodium through the kidney um, or dialysis, especially if they cannot make an, make an urine because of kidney disease, then you might actually need to consider uh, dialysis in these uh, patients and you might need nephrology consultation anyways to help you with the management of these sick patients. Uh, so in summary, Usually, we don't really divide hypernatremia into hypovolemic, hypervolemic, and eovolemic, like hyponatremia. But you know, there's um, again something that you can consider if you want, if uh, if it makes your assessment uh, easier. So, if you have a patient with hypernatremia, then you look at the volume status. If you if you think the patient is hypovolemic. Uh, then you look at the urine osmolality, you look at the urine sodium, and if the urine osmolality is high and urine sodium is low, this is kind of the normal uh, uh, kidney response we talked about. So uh, in this case, then you, uh, you know, look for the history of GI loss or skin loss, and then uh, replace the water accordingly. Uh, if there is, um, the urine osmolality is not as high and urine sodium is also more than 20, then there might be increase in the load of sodium. So you need to check uh, for the internal feeding, make sure there's no like excess uh, uh, sodium being given or you know check for mannitol or hyperglycemia, which can lead to also um, uh, polyuria and increased salt, salt and water loss. And then you just reverse the underlying cause and again re replace the water. Now, if the patient is the other way, um, or the other spectrum of the scale, the patient is hypervolemic, you think, uh, given the clinical uh, evaluation, then, um, you know, most of the time this could be due to um, giving excess salt in form of hypertonic saline or excess salt in the TPN. So you need to stop that and, you know, give uh, uh, replaced water as well. Or if the patient has sort of hypertension and hypokalemia, uh, and they have like mild hypermephemia, this could be um, uh, primary uh, hyperaldosteronism or uh, what used to be known as Kahn syndrome. So uh, again, in this patient, usually the hypernatremia is mild. And if the patient has intact thirst mechanism and they have access to water, this usually doesn't happen. So, um, you know, most of the time you need to think about uh, primary hyperaldosteronism anyways in patients with resistant hypertension. Uh, especially if there are three or four medications and they're a little bit hard to control. It might be a, a under-recognized cause of hypertension, just like a side note. Uh, and then if the patient is volumic, not apparently hypovolemic, not apparently hypervolemic, then, you know, if the patient is having, for example, increase or uh, decrease your osmolality less than 300, water seems to be a little bit dilute and maybe they have, like, increased urine output, then there could be diabetes insipidus. You can confirm that by the water deprivation test and then if it's positive then you can give a DH and then check for the response to see if neurogenic or uh, uh, central or nephrogenic uh, diabetes insipidus and again we'll talk about that in another video hopefully and then um, 
if, uh, if the patient uh, has a history of hypo, dipsia, or decreased thirst uh, for any reason, they're elderly, dementia, uh, then you just need to give them free water and um, maybe you need to give them uh, water in regular intervals to prevent hyponatremia from happening. And then also they have they're in the ICU, they're uh, on mechanical ventilation, maybe they have other losses that you need to replace uh, for. So you can keep that in mind as well. So this is kind of a quick you know, summary if you, if you want to think about hypernatremia from the volume standpoint. Also remember if they're like severely hypervolemic and they are hemodynamically unstable, you need to support the circulation with a uh, ceiling, with isotonic fluid before you replace the water. Okay, so uh, let's take this example. This is from uh, MixUp, Medical Knowledge Self-Assessment Program. Very nice book by the American College of Physicians. Um, just to kind of give an example of how to, you know, do the management steps um, one by one. It also gives a good uh, example of, you know, how, what, how to think about the uh, cause of uh, hyperneutremia. So, uh, you can pause uh, uh, the video and then try to answer the question before we get into the answer. Okay, so it's basically 65 year old woman, right? She's in the ICU. She had a, a severe pyelonephritis with septic shock and she started to develop hyperneutremia while she was in the ICU. She also had AKI and non oligarch kidney, uh, uh, acute kidney injury. And she's, she's like she's improving, but her sodium is in the higher, in the higher side, right? Um, it went from 142 to 148. And then uh, they give you the urine output, which is 2.5 over the last 24 hours. And so this is, this is the first thing that really kind of should draw, draw your attention, right? So if you have hyponatremia, it means there's uh, less water theoretically, so the normal kidney response should be to try to preserve water, to decrease the urine output and decrease the uh, urine osmolality. It seems like this is not happening. It's the urine output is a little bit on the higher side too. So you need to think about what's causing the water diuresis or you know, increased output in this case. They give you labs, uh, you know, it's AKI and QSBN and creatinine. The rest of the labs, you know, largely unremarkable, apart from the hypernatremia maybe, and um, uh, um, urosmolality is for, for, uh, 420. Also, you know, I expect it to be a little bit higher with the normal response. Okay, so with this uh, decrease, uh, increased urine output, so adrenal insufficiency uh, usually causes hype, uh, you, um, you high hyponatremia, right? So uh, hypernatremia is less common and um, also, it doesn't give you like increased urine output, so that's not really an option there. Uh, central DI, uh, yes, you can get increased urine output, um, and but there is usually you suspect some uh, uh, neurological disease. The patient seems like you know she's 56, no history of neurological problems. She had UTI and pyelonephritis. So it's all in the kidneys. So why would she develop central DI? Uh, also, a little bit less likely. Uh, glycosuria is possible, you know, you know, you can get increased uh, polyuria with, with uh, increased glucose, but the glucose is actually not high, it's 136. So um, also that seems to be a little bit remote. So we're left with osmotic diuresis and this can explain the water loss and the increased urine output and polyuria. But what do you think is causing the osmotic diuresis if it's not the glucose, which is kind of maybe the most common one? In this case, it's actually the BUN, so uh, it's an exomotically active um, uh, substrate. So if you remember the equation for the serum osmolality, uh, it's made by the uh, sodium and uh, also you have to correct for the glucose and for the BUN as well. And in some equations, they use the potassium, although it's a you know, small contribution compared to the sodium. But it's mostly the sodium, the glucose, and uh, the BUN. So in this case, you know, because of the AKI, uh, BUN is really high uh, relative to the creatinine that could increase the urine output and polyuria. Okay, so 
you think that's the cause so really what you're going to do is you just give the water back since you hopefully with uh, antibiotics and supportive care you think that you know her kidney function will improve her BN hopefully will go down and you treat the underlying cause but meanwhile you need to um, treat the um, uh, hypernatremia so basically uh, uh, um, you want to take the sodium from 148 to 140 let's assume that the weight of the patient is 80 uh, so that uh, doing the maths um, and the equations that we mentioned before we did the uh, calculations and it turned to be like 2.3 liters so she need about two this is a water deficit 2.3 liters um, it's because 148 is not very uh, high which is good and um, and then again don't uh, forget to add the uh, ongoing losses so we estimated that maybe around 1.5 um, or 6 so if you add that to 2.3 that will uh, take you to a total of 3.5 to up to 4 liters let's assume that you will need 4 liters so basically we need to give this patient 4 liters over 48 um, hours to replace her water so you can give the first two liters in the first day um, you know she's intubated um, maybe she cannot uh, really drink orally maybe she had an the tube hopefully she had been in the ICU for six days so ideally she should have an NG tube by now and have some nutrition so you can give her the water through the NG tube half of it maybe like a liter through the NG tube and then a liter through the D5W or you can give both uh, two liters you know IV or orally whatever is feasible uh, since we think that her gut is probably intact there's no history of GI disease so that's good and then the other two liters you're going to give it over the next uh, two days also the same thing orally or IV if you want to give IV it's going to be the D5W patients seem to be hemodynamically stable so you really don't want to give uh, saline or isotonic fluid at this point and then most importantly you need to kind of measure the serum sodium serially to make sure that it's not overcorrected and to make sure that you're not undercorrecting it too and you want you don't want your patient to be persistently hyperneutrimic because that's as associated with also uh, a worse outcome just like you know overcorrection so this is kind of a, a summary um, of how to uh, replace a, a water in hyperneutrimia i hope this was useful and uh, please in the comments uh, send me any feedback um, if you have um, any particular uh, note i would really appreciate it all right thank you very much and see you in the next video bye bye